Welcome to this Way of Fire YouTube video. Today it's me, Andy, and I will be looking at The Silver Bayonet from Joseph McCulloch and published by Osprey Games. A war game of Napoleonic Gothic horror. Well, anyway. So this is a rule book in the same vein as Rangers of Shadow Deep, Frostgrave, Stargrave, the other games from Joseph McCulloch. Um, it is set in Napoleonic Wars, but really any sort of Black Powder era would be fine. You could run it in uh, French Indian War or Colonial Wars or something like that. It would suit very nicely. £25 uh, retail price, but you can get it a lot cheaper uh, from online retailers. And I think let's start with the book itself. So it's a hardback book. Um, about 160 pages, I think it is. Something like that. Yeah, about 160 pages. Um, it's very nice. It's got a faux sort of look to it, like an old... Um, style book. The back, not particularly interesting, I'll be honest. Uh, just relatively bland text. But when you open it up, I really like this. This crazy colour. So this lovely pink sort of tie-dye effect is pretty common in old books, so they've tried to mimic that, which I really think is a nice little touch. So let's have a look inside. So, we have a contents page, of course. Uh, a bit of line art, so you'll see some line art throughout. Uh, contents page explains how you're going to go through things. We'll go through all of that. And a bit of background. So there is a little bit of fluff here to say that uh, why are these Napoleonic uh, soldiers, rather than fighting Napoleon, um, or on Napoleon's behalf, fighting the other nations, why are they actually fighting against these weird gribblies? And there's a bit of a backstory about this thing called the Harvestman. So the Harvestman is a spirits or demons that feed off the uh, land of men. And they present with lots of horrid creatures and so on. And then each nation not only fighting against each other, but they fight against the Harvestman and they take the best of the best, like the SAS equivalent really, uh, to deal with these horrific creatures. Um, just general introduction to how to play, so it starts very basic, which is fine. Miniatures, terrain, a dice you will need, some beautiful uh, art in a few different places. Tokens, so you need clue tokens, fatigue tokens, which is a newish thing. Fatigue isn't in some of the other games you do. Uh, you also probably need one for reloading as well, which I doesn't mention. And then a the dice, the dice is a big difference from other um, a colour game, so rather than a d20, get used to that from Frostgrave for instance, it's two d10s, so um, you're getting a result from two to twenty there rather than one to twenty. So a little bit less random, and also the dice are not just two d10s, they call them a skill dice and a power dice. It's just a name for each of the d10s, it's meant to use a different colour, but that's the only difference. Uh, and they equate to how weapons do damage as well. So you say they've called a skill dice, they've said red, a power dice blue, and then a the monster dice in black. I'll mention monster dice later on. In your standard deck of cards, you do not need all 52 cards. You actually only need a very small number, but a uh, standard deck of cards is what's used in each scenario. Uh, you need inches on a measuring tape or something like that, and that's it, really. So, how do you create a unit? Well, everyone has an officer. And then a series of troops under them, sort of six or seven is probably about the right number. And they've got the major nations, Austria, Britain, France, Prussia, Russia, and Spain. So the smaller nations like Portugal and the Netherlands, Italy, Bavaria, Sweden, they're not individually represented, but you, you suggest that you just take the closest aligned ones. So if you're running Hanoverians, you might say British because they dressed very similarly and they were outfitted by them. Same for Bavarians, you might say French or possibly German, or Prussian I should say, because um, who they fought for. And Italians you'd probably say French because they were basically a vassal state of France. Uh, there's an interesting bit about uniforms. Now, I'm a bit of a stitch counter, but not too bad a one. Uh, but it quite clearly says this is a science fiction fantasy game. You know, it's set in this period, but it is not a historical game. Okay, let's be honest about this. There's vampires and goblins and all sorts of things. So, you use a bit of common sense and just play for fun, basically, is what it's saying. There's no wrong uniform. So, you choose your officer. You get some base stats here. You can recognise these are very similar if you play the other games. He has courage, though. That uh, would have been equivalent to sort of will, I think. But plays perhaps a slightly bigger role in this game than it does in some of the others. And then... 
you can also see that you can then modify your stats a little bit by increasing a few of them as you choose to do uh, during recruitment and then you have a recruitment points 100 points typically for which you buy the rest of your squad you also get a series of attributes and there's a whole list of these at the back of the book um, that you can choose and then some general equipment which is your sort of weaponry sword different types of swords muskets those sorts of things not a huge range of stuff uh, and you must remember to take ammunition um, a cartridge box to take for anything that has black powder in it as well and you can see at the bottom here there's some the different weapons you notice that some have obviously they have different ranges and things like that and equipment slots but you'll notice that when they do damage they use different dice so some use a power dice some have modified up or down and some use a skill dice so when you roll those two dice to hit yes you may hit but then the damage that is applied will be the damage off of the appropriate dice so you might hit but do minimal damage because most of the benefit of actually making the hit work came from a dice that you're not using Special armory, so there is some extra stuff here for things that might deal with goblins or uh, vampires or werewolves, you know, strange creatures. And then we go on to selecting your soldiers. This guy's really cool as well. Love him. So what soldiers can you have? Well, it depends on your nation. So there's a slight variation depending on different nations. Some can have uh, some that others can't. For instance, you can't have a Highlander in a French army. You can only have that in the British. And these are the different ones. It's the same sort of thing as companions in Rangers of Shadowdeep. You pay your recruitment costs. They come with a set number of weapons and sometimes attributes as well, and a stat profile. And to all intents and purposes, they are exactly the same as your officer, except they don't progress quite as well. And there's a whole bunch of different ones. Grenadiers, doctors, guards... Infantrymen, standard infantrymen, uh, irregulars, cavalrymen, marines, uh, what else have we got? Occultists, riflemen, sailors, supernatural investigators, sappers, swordsmen, uh, tacticians, and veteran hunters. And then one of my favourites, the Russian werebear. I mean, that just sounds good, right? Uh, also, I quite like the Vivandier as well. These were women who accompanied the army and provided, usually wives of soldiers, and provided refreshments and things like that. So, for creating a unit, very simple, not a lot of different things. You just choose what to buy and you can have as many as you want. Playing the game. So, the general game is a competitive game. You each take a uh, officer and a team of specialist investigators stroke monster hunters and you try to gain clues and achieve the mission objectives. And in so doing so, you're competing against each other and against any monsters that may be on the battlefield. The turn sequence goes in, you roll for initiative, you roll two dice, and if there is a double two or a double ten, then something different may happen. You choose a primary player, they do half theirs, then the monsters move. Secondary player does all of their moves, and then the primary player does half theirs again. Like I said, there are some unexpected things happen, so if you get a double ten... You get some cool stuff happening here or if you get a double one you get extra monsters arriving and you can have a look at some of those monsters you'll recognize a lot of those and it's not an exhaustive list it does suggest that you could make your own but i strongly suspect there will be future supplements that tends to be what these sort of style of books come with and that there soon be another supplement with extra stuff in it so when you activate, you have to move. Um, well, you don't have to move, but you can, uh, you, you can take two actions, one of which must be a move. So you can move and shoot or reload or investigate or something like that. If you move into combat, you get to fight for free now, which is a new thing compared to um, some of the previous versions. Um, also, movement's a little bit different. If you move normally, that's great. If you want to move a second with a second action, so you have to make a sprint test. And then if you succeed, you can move four inches. If you don't succeed, you move two inches. That's so slightly different as well from some of the other games. Usual sort of stuff about climbing, jumping, a lot of freedom of movement. You must reload your black powder weapons. So that's something new as well. So you could have a situation where you could shoot, but you haven't got a loaded weapon to do so. And then let's have a little look at fighting. It's also a bit different. So rather than a straight up oppose role, say in Frostgrave and Stargrave or Rangers, what you do here is you make an attack and if you 
succeed, the opponent can then, sorry, you do your attack first, and then the opponent can choose to have a strike back or back off. If they strike back, then they get to fight. If they back off, then they just move away. And also at the end of a fight, you will pick up some fatigue as well, which will modify your future defense and melee stats by minus one, making it harder for you to hit and more likely that you get hit in return. And it's a similar thing for shooting. If you shoot at someone, they can shoot you back if they have a loaded weapon or they can dive for cover. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, not something you see that often in people being able to shoot back and return fire. So I quite like that. So a little bit of cavalry, not a lot. There is no artillery, of course, in a game like this. It's a skirmish game. And then there's a section here on terror. So some creatures are so terrifying that they will have a risk of making your courage fail. So there's a test here for that. Another new thing as well is this fate pool. So in a standard game against an opponent, you have two power dice, two skill dice, and one monster die. And what these are is they're kept to the side and you can use them to spend to modify your own real rolls. So power dice, for instance, if you've got a duff roll on your power dice, you can spend one of your power dice from your fate pool to either re-roll or to potentially negate some damage or quick reload. And then um, that's the way it would work. So for negating damage, you can use either of the two dice. If you roll a dice, uh, you get a 10 then you negate all the damage you took. If you get less than a 10, you negate half rounded uh, down, uh, rounded up, sorry, big pardon. Rerolls are only for the dice you have, and quick reload, you can spend either of them as well. Now the monster dice, you only have one of those. Monster dice is to modify monster attacks to either keep a monster alive or do more damage with a monster. So that's really for attacking your opponent rather than for benefiting you directly. It's different in the solo game. The monsters have an AI rule, that's very familiar for those who've played these games before, but it's very simple but very intuitive and you don't have to look at the book once you've played it once or twice. And then there's an end in the game, which obviously every scenario has an end to it. There's a bit about campaigns, particularly how you level up, madness and injuries that can accrue, and how you gain different experience and how it modifies your um, courage or shooting or whatever. Uh, great! So let's just skip on to the next bit. So the scenarios, there are 10 scenarios in this book, uh, relatively straightforward. You know, each one has a page, maybe two pages of detail about how to do them. You notice here, like I said about not needing the whole deck of cards, there's only five cards you actually need for this one. And these are for the uh, competitive games against another opponent. Um, so they're different for the solo games, which I will come on to shortly. So 10 of those, very nice. 10 is a good number, I think. Tells you a little bit how to create your own scenarios, of course, if you want to. And then solo play, which is probably how I will play, be playing mostly and how I will be playing on the channel, certainly to start with. So it's very similar. Slightly different turn sequence, of course, where you do half, then the monsters go, then you do the other half. That will be familiar to those who play Rangers of Shadow Deep. Um, because obviously there's no other player. You also get a reduced fate pool. You'll notice only have one skill dice and one power dice uh, and no monster dice because the monsters are only attacking me so why would I need a monster dice? You also don't get unexpected events and encounters either. Uh, it obviously tells you how to create them again and then there are four linked or roughly linked uh, solo scenarios. Wolf Pack, Ruin Chapel, The Troll Hunts, and the last mile. And I have the uh, models for the French that come from North Star, who are supporting this uh, release. And I'll be setting mine in the retreat from Moscow or thereabouts. So expect some snow covered ones for me. And my friend Kev, obviously uh, also from the channel, he is going to be running the Brits and the Spanish. And then there's a bestiary at the end, so this is all the different monsters. You'll recognise a lot of these monsters from other games of the same type. So wolves, cultists, um, demons, goblins, and so on and so forth. And then at the very back, you've got the list of all the attributes we talked about uh, briefly before. So these are the different things that make your character different. Your officer mainly.
Okay, and then a unit sheet, which you could just download from the Osprey website or the Silver Bayonet um, Facebook page. And finally, just an advert at the end. I will show this though, because Nick Air's North Star is producing a complementary range. Here is the French, uh, looks like possibly Bavarians there, not quite sure. Uh, Brits here, Spanish down the bottom there, I think. Actually, they're the same, actually, they're both Spanish, I think. So, um, great. So, should you get the silver bayonet? Well, I don't know, it's entirely up to you. Uh, I'm just providing some information for you to make a balanced judgment on. It's not expensive. Um, I think it's good to support games like this. They allow you to use pretty much your own miniatures. If you have any historical ones, it's not a historical game, but it is quite fun, I think. Um, I've got plenty of different types of miniatures, of historical ones and fantasy ones, so I shouldn't need to spend a huge amount buying new miniatures to support playing this game. It's solo and competitive, so, I mean, really, what's not to love? Um, if you're used to the this style of game, it'll all be very familiar to you. If you're not used to it, I certainly think that this or any of the others would certainly worth a try because they are a lot of fun. Uh, re relatively simple to play, doesn't require a huge amount of expenditure on your part if you've got a reasonable collection of miniatures and terrain and so on. And can be played on quite a small surface, so two and a half to three feet are most of the mission sizes. So really as an expenditure, it's, it's not crazy at all. And it really does look like a fun game. Uh, like I say, I will be playing mine in 1812 Russia uh, and probably the Peninsula as well against Kevs. And I'll probably also do a bit of colonial stuff as well. I've got some British on the retreat from uh, Kabul in the first Afghan war, which I think would suit really nicely for discovering strange, mysterious things in the hills. So I might have a go with those as well. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and please check us out on the Way to Fire Facebook page or the Way to Fire Hobby Hangout where you'll see me posting up what I've been working on as well as the other members of the Hobby Hangout. So thanks very much everyone, take care and bye.